It's uh, 10.59. We're on time. Mm -hmm. Take it down. Extraordinaire here, Miss Mary Girassi. Hello. And we have two exciting guests today because we're going to talk about Big Pharma and how it's affecting your life. Just like anywhere in the United States of America, it of um, drugs, how drugs are produced and how they're sold affects every single one of us and people we love. As you know, I'm the Medicare lady. Yep. I help people successfully age on to Medicare. So we're going to talk about Part D. And we're going to talk about how they just don't even um, negotiate with drug prices when it comes to Part D. And Medicare is a huge player in the drug industry. Yeah, you know, I hate to say it. You can pick any subject in the world. You can roll dices on it, and there's a political connection to it somehow. That's right. And, um, so Kath who do we Catherine have with us today? We have Miss Catherine DeBakiak. Drabiak. Uh, Drabiak, yeah. I knew that was going to be a challenge. <laughs> but she's an associate professor at the University of South Florida at the Colleges of Public Health and Medicine. And we have a doctor on the line. He's calling in all the way from Fort Myers, Florida, because, you know, we're taping from Tampa. But he's uh, Raymond... Corden, corduroy. Corduroy. Okay. Corduroy. Like corduroy. <laughs> yes, corduroy. Yeah. Corduroy. Yeah. Corduroy. Corduroy. He's a general internist, and he's a, a member of the Florida Medical Association, the American Medical Association, and the Southwest Florida Chapter of Free Market Association. So he's quite knowledgeable on the issue of big pharma. So those are our two guests today. And I also wanted to include that Catherine is also a medical ethicist. And are you a lawyer or did you study law? I, trained as a JD and not licensed in the state of Florida. But yes, a medical ethicist and assistant professor in the colleges of public health and medicine. Yes. Okay, so she knows the law and she knows if it's ethical and what's ethical and what's not. So uh, Angela likes to begin at the beginning. Take it away, Angela. <laughs> okay, you know what? Um Doctor, can you tell us um, where you went to school and how you got involved um, in the medical industry and all the things you've been doing so, thus far? Oh, uh, thank you. So uh, I, I attended medical school at the University of Kansas. I also did my undergraduate training there. I was born and raised in North Dakota. I'm a first generation physician. <clears throat> um, I did my residency here in Florida at, uh, in Orlando. At that time, it was called Orlando Healthcare System. Uh, excuse me, Orlando Regional Healthcare System at that time. Um, and uh, after training there, I uh, entered private practice um, here with uh, joining two small partnerships. We went through multiple transitions, uh, which is in and of itself a long story. But bottom line is, in the last two years, I've returned to private practice, um, which I think is a unique perspective for your audience because uh, people don't know this, but in the last 10 years, uh, private practice physicians have changed from being about 80% of your providers to now somewhere between 20 and 35, 30%, excuse me. So we've lost the majority of private practice uh, in the last 10 years. Why would that be? Well, well that, that has to do with um, um, the forces that are here. Uh, the, the idea of a third-party payment system uh, is creating um, consolidation and corporatization of uh, health care, and um, that's resulting in a lot of financial pressure and stressors, and, um, it, which have caused uh, a lot of the physicians to have to leave uh, solo practice because it's just the overhead of practicing medicine has become excessive. Kathleen, I know you can talk to that. Um, corporatization, um, insurance frauds, insurance, um, prices of medication, it's, it, just, it just sounds like a giant mess. Now, Catherine, tell us a little about you, where you 
started in life and sure. how you got where you are. Sure. Um, so um, I'm uh, trained as an attorney, um, uh, have my um, JD, um, but I've been practicing uh, in, in academia, um, working in academia, um, in, in health law and in medical ethics. Um, and, and I've looked at a number of different issues. And, and really what I'm interested in um, is looking at how to use the law as a tool for um, transparency, accountability, and uh, for really helping vulnerable populations. Um, and so one of the ways um, that, that I've seen this happen in the, the corporatization of medicine um, that, that we're discussing is that physicians um, are sometimes uh, compelled um, and feel pushed um, to, um, to um, uh, abuse in, in the system. So when we talk about um, fraud and abuse, it's kind of bending the rules, um, kind of adding on to patient diagnoses um, or saying that they spent more time with patients um, so that they can get, um, what, whether it's the, the reimbursement or the medication or something that the patient actually needs, um, but that um, uh, the, the billing rules and requirements and other things from the insurance companies um, may be hesitant to provide. And so there's this kind of push-pull um, and sense of uh, Robin Hood almost, uh, that you have to game the system in order to, uh, physicians have to, to get what their patients actually need. Um, and so there's, uh, there's this sense of injustice in that, um, and, and most physicians are just trying to do the best by their patients and feel pulled in multiple directions. Do you find it hard to um, serve your patients the way you liked? I know we had talked about prescriptions. Uh, you were talking about generic drugs. Tell me how you feel about the system that you have to deal with all the time. Uh, I assume, is that directed to me? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> um, well, that's very interesting because, as I said in my career, just in the last two years, I entered private practice. Um, the reason I did it was for ethical reasons. Um, and uh, again, as a general internist who takes care of uh, adults in the majority of their care, so in other words, I'm the front line, um, the third parties uh, have caused me to compromise my ethics, and I could not do that anymore. I felt uh, morally injured, and I literally was depressed and wanted to quit the profession. And um, so, um, and that's because the physician oath is to their patients. And unfortunately, uh, where we are in America and in the world probably, but in America with healthcare is we have a lot of people arguing for how we're supposed to take care of our patients. And unfortunately, we're not being allowed to actually uh, be the leader of that decision process. And uh, so the only way to, to address all of these problems, in my opinion, in my personal experience was to remove myself from the, from the uh, third party process. So what I've done, and, and by the way, to the prescription issue, the biggest problem I had was we had gotten so far into the weeds in terms of the control and authorization process that um, I couldn't even prescribe a generic medication without that being questioned. In other words, for cost reasons, the payers, and by the way, your payers are your insurance companies, but they're also your government, um, through, their, through their policies and, and uh, uh, cooperation with the insurance industry, um, we've gone to a point where to shave pennies, they're trying to interfere with the physician's day-to-day -day choices. I would literally be given a call several times a day, every day of my career, telling me that my medicine, whether it's prescribed as a name brand or a, or a patented project, in other words, as a, a name brand or a generic, was being refuted. And uh, I was just like, this is just so wrong. I, I just did a visit. I just spent all this time with this patient. I just made the decision, the clinical decision, which is absolutely appropriate. And now I'm being told that my recommendation won't be honored for payment reasons. So my initial plan uh, to deal with that was to just tell patients, well, you have a choice to just pay for the medicine. Um, but that, the public in general is not aware of that. So that's an important point to make to everybody to understand that you always have the choice of stepping out of the system if you need to. So, uh, so what happened was I eventually decided I'm going to dispense medicines myself because I have about 40 meds that I generally prescribe for most conditions. 
Um, obviously, I write more different. In other words, it's whatever's needed. But in general, there's a certain set of medications for the main chronic medical problems that I write. So I said, well, we're just going to buy them. And in Florida, with proper licensing, which I pursue, I can dispense these medications and I can charge for them uh, what I uh, what I what I can. Uh, and what I do is. In my patient, talking about transparency, I have a totally transparent practice. All my prices and all my services are posted online. Um, and now, so, doctor, uh, I, I believe- interrupt you for one moment. Uh, when mm-hmm. you're saying the word third parties, are you talking about insurers? I'm talking about insurance as well as, uh, as, well as uh, um, Medicare and Medicaid. Because what I, mean, what I mean by that is, in a normal, in a normal, normal transaction of service, uh, the buyer is the, in this case, the buyer is the patient. It should be the patient, I should say. And then the physician is, uh, in my case, because I'm a doctor, but if you're, let's say, you're a hospital, it's a different story, or if you're a uh, home health agency, it's a different story. But the point is, we're the ones providing the service. So what's happened is, uh, because we've chosen to use insurance as our method of accessing health care, as a general rule, uh, we've given up our control of our say in this, and that's where the problem is. The physicians have lost control too now. Initially, it was just the patients, but now it's the physicians as well. So that's what I mean when I refer to the third party. <clears throat> now, I'm so, a little surprised that they would give you pushback on generics because usually... Oh, yes. That, oh, yes. That's that, been going on. That, mm-hmm. Usually yep. that's, that's, that's the, uh, the cheaper way to... to the preferred way, yeah. Preferred and cheaper way. It, it is. It, it clearly is the preferred way. Um, but because, again, now you get into the, the issue of what we call prescription benefits management industry. Because of the way the money gets divvied, um, there have been... Um, a job has been created for what we call prescription ma- benefits management companies their job is to try to uh, create large networks of access for medications. The idea behind it was well intended, which was to help lower costs by creating efficiency. But we've gotten a paradoxical result. Um, and what's happened is the prescription benefits management companies uh, have become the controllers of the market. And what that means is they'll say to companies, if you give us a massive discount, then we'll give you access and priority to our formulary. And that even goes down to the generic medications. So in truth, generic medications uh, are very competitively priced already. And what they're doing is trying to pocket some more of that. And that's how they do it. So what happens is these prescription benefit management companies state for blood pressure when it comes to the class of drugs, for instance, called uh, ACE inhibitors, which is just one class of medications that works a certain way to lower blood pressure, instead of offering you all the generic options, they say, we're only going to pick two or one. And if that so, doctor uh, writes so for one of those saying, others, um, we're, we're going to deny it. Pardon oh, me? Okay, so it's not that it's a generic, it's a specific generic. So let's say it's Lasartan right. versus Amlotropine or something. Correct, correct. So they're saying we don't want to pay for, we, we couldn't get the price we wanted for this drug, or in this particular case, it might even be, if you agree to be our supplier, we will make this our preferred drug. Now, are um, those usually higher price generics? Well, again, interestingly, um, that leads to, um, that has led to some shortages. So the answer to your question is, because they're forcing these contracts that are volume-based, they're creating a situation where competitors that could provide market share and and keep the prices down, competitive, they're leaving the market because they're not getting contracts. And so what happens is this has actually caused a shift upward. If if you were to look on inflation for medications, generic medications have have experienced a massive inflation. Yeah. um, And partly it's because of the prescription benefit management companies agreeing um, on prices that uh, aren't necessarily in the best interest of the buyer, but in the best interest of their organization. We only have a couple of minutes left for this segment. We're going to bring uh, Catherine in and maybe talk about how ethical or not ethical all this has become. It, It doesn't sound good, and it sounds like the patient is the one who's suffering. And now we're hearing from doctor, doctor. and I was just going to throw that in. 
and just hearing from um, Doc on the line saying it's uh, his practice is suffering as well. And, you know, he's trying to make ethical choices and the system is fighting against it. So we'll bring you back in and talk about that. Doc, we'll be right back in two minutes, okay? Thank you. Excellent. Junior, your motivational guru. This is the DLD Motivational Moment. One darn second. America since 2017 is suffering from a serious hiccup. 9-11 is seriously overused in a distasteful manner. Every day the cops are calling on an innocent, innocent person of color. It amazes me that America has come down to this. A person of color becomes a person of interest. Waffle House, the dorm, Starbucks is a few. This is not the lunch counters, sit-ins of the 1960s. 2019, harassed simply for being black and proud. Hold on one darn second. This has been the DLD Motivational Moment. Pre-order my new book, Motivational Moments, at DLD28-2002 at yahoo.com or 813-394-5875. Been in a car crash? Call Ricky. Don't know what to do? Ask Ricky. We will connect you with a lawyer and doctor experience in auto accident injuries. Call Ricky at 844-361-7425. After an auto accident, you have 14 days to seek medical attention. You may be in pain. So call Ricky. Ask Ricky for your best options. 844-361-7425. Call Ricky. Ask Ricky is a legal and medical referral service. The lawyers in our network pay to receive referrals. Yeah. And uh, we're talking to a doctor and an attorney today. So um, what I do want to know about how um, prescription drugs and Medicare Part D is, um, is being affected. And because it's, we keep hearing that they can't even negotiate the price of drugs on Part D. It's uh, What do you feel about that? Yeah, Catherine, what do, what do you think uh, the ethical aspects of that are? Doctor, we'll bring you in. Feel free to chime in as well. You're on the line with us. Um, the ethical uh, ethicality behind something like that. You know, when people have to be driven to Canada by Bernie Sanders to get their insulin because it's cheaper and they're dying. There's people making choices. I'm not going to eat today. I can't pay my rent. I got to get my my scripts for drugs. And and being the Medicare lady, Medicaid lady, you know all about that. So what do you think? What's so, going on? So this is one of the, the big things that I think a lot of people have seen um, because a lot of people know somebody who uh, who needs insulin or um, has an EpiPen. Uh, we saw this uh a couple of years ago right. when the price of the EpiPen just spiked um, and people can't afford their insulin right now. So this is a this is a substantial issue, not only the, the question of can I afford my medication, um, am I going to suffer you know, ill health effects because of this, um, but uh, there's been a number of cases um, actually looking at um, is there something more going on, right? So we want in the marketplace um, better products, free competition, and for physicians to choose and prescribe the appropriate medication for their patients. Um, but there's been a number of lawsuits looking into um, allegations that a number of these uh, companies are actually sitting down, having lunches. Um, the top three pharmaceutical yeah. giants were yes. found to be in collusion. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, the C um, word. Um, you know, alleging that there's uh, conversations back and forth about um, price fixing, price gouging, allegedly, and, and other activities going on that we think are um, uh, not in the best interest of the consumer. So in, in legal, legal terms, or it's, illegal. it's in legal terms, there is allegations of antitrust. Antitrust. So basically bargaining against what should ordinarily be seen in, in a free market. Competitive market. Capitalism survives on competition. Right. Dear, I'd like to hear your uh, take on this. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. You you want my take? 
Well, you know what? Did you hear yeah. about that uh, news story where three of the top pharmaceutical giants were found to be in collusion with each other, having lunches, discussing prices? Mm-hmm. Did you hear about that? Well, obviously, obviously that, that is not something we should be condoning as a society, a uh, collaboration to that level. You know, and again, that's part of the problem we're having in America with this idea of um, consolidation. You, you, it's good in terms of it can be good for efficiencies, but when it becomes artificial, meaning because legislators are promoting these kinds of behaviors, that's where uh, They're things paid become off. unethical. That's a nice way of saying yeah. it. They're paid off. Yeah. Doctor, yeah. do you have the radio on while you're talking? I do not. Oh, okay, because we have a little echo. I apologize. But yeah, I okay. mean, we're, we're talking to somebody who's saying right now, they're looking into the fact that if it's legal or not. Is it, Catherine? So part of the, the way that, um, that these lawsuits are helpful um, for, for people to understand what's actually going on is you think about, um, you know, th- there's private lunches, but there's also um, every time that you send uh, an email or a phone call, these paper trails. And so part of what these lawsuits do and that I've looked at in research and other areas is um, digging through those paper trails. So what did these people and different companies actually say to each other? What did they know? What did they agree on? So that's what I think we're going to start to see with some of these lawsuits. And are is there merit behind these allegations? So, of course, the companies fully deny that there's any type of um, uh, price fixing or uh, conversations to that nature. Um, but when we start to see emails back and forth, that's where we're going to see, well, what, what's true. actually going on? Yeah. And the patient um, ends up suffering the most. And then there's the undeniable fact that, that the big pharma makes $300 billion a year. Nobody's hurting. Uh, prices have gone up 300%, 100% on basic drugs. Um, maybe 10 years ago, I have allergies. I would get Claritin and a bottle of Claritin. They charged my, uh, insurance company $99. So I didn't have to pay for it. My insurance covered it. And then they made it generic. You can get it over the counter or buy right. It's still considered Claritin. And that's gone up three times already. Again, getting back to the generics. I mean, it's gouge, gouge, gouge. They, I feel like we are, our lives are in hostage, the medical pharmaceutical industry is holding us in hostage if we can't pay for it. I mean, you know, we're going to die. There's people dying because they can't afford their Doctor, meds. Doctor, do you see any solutions to this? <laughs> well, yeah, I've taken, again, I, I, you know, we can talk uh, and then we have to walk. And so um, I did the walking part. So my solution was I became the buyer for my patients. So again, inside of my program, uh, what I've done is I pass through the cost of medicines that I buy. I, ha- I charge a handling fee, and that's stated. It's $8. But I'll write for, let's say you're on a chronic drug, we'll allocate 90 to 100 days, depending on how we purchase it. Um, and if it costs us, uh, let's say it costs us, and believe it or not, these are real prices, um, $5.70 for 90 days of pills, then we will charge $13.79. Um, and so what's happening is our patients are actually foregoing their insurance claims um, and including our Medicare patients are choosing to get their medicines directly from us because the cost is cheaper and they get service the same day and it's doctor directed. Um, it's, it's really ideal and it works extremely well. Um, and uh, so hard examples, um, I've actually um, I'm on public record informing people, for instance, uh, the uh, generic medication for the new, uh, whether you know it or not, Viagra, the wonderful sex pill, right? <laughs> um, that medicine has gone generic. And I had a patient who I wrote, a Medicare patient, I wrote a script for him. He was out of town for 30, which is a lot, but that, given that it's generic, it shouldn't be too expensive. His insurance through Mar- Medicare Part D is a secondary uh, wanted him to pay, uh, I think it was either 700 or $900 for this. For 30 pills? And I said, well, yeah, so uh, I said, well, call my office. I don't know what it costs, but call my <laughs> office, get a price quote. I was on vacation at the time. And I come back and I asked him, I said, well, what did we charge you for those 30 pills? And he told me that it was uh, around $35. Yeah. Wow, a 
dollar a pill. Yeah, or yeah, three dollars if I you got, have insurance. Well, Again, it's gouging, down, gouging, it's gouging. Gonna go down, it's going to go down fast. I think the thirty-five dollars included my eight-dollar charge fee. So, <laughs> um, so, so then we're back to you know other examples. I can give you examples all day long. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Zetia, which now went generic as a Zetamide, to speak to the value of, of how the market can help. That pill used to be nine dollars a tablet. And within a year of losing patent and getting three competitors into the market, we brought that pill down to uh, on the order of 37 cents a tablet. Now, doctor, can you explain to people the difference between a um, generic and um, a brand name drug? Oh, are they, sure. Are they yeah. exactly the same? Some people say they still can't use a generic. But this well, is so it's a great... Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's, th this is a great subject. I hope I can give you guys a very uh, uh, terse uh, brief answer. Thank you. That's that. why you're here. The answer is, yeah, the answer is they're the same medication. So when, when a drug becomes patent protected under name brand, so we'll give the example of Cozar, that's a blood pressure pill. You mentioned it earlier. The generic is Losartan. So Cozar was made by Merck. They studied it. They proved its benefits. The FDA gave them approval. And it is FDA controlled and regulated as, and manufactured uh, under that kind of uh, surveillance. But when that patent ran out, then it be, then the uh, the other manufacturers can come in and provide this compound. So the active ingredient is the generic name, Losartan. What has to be different is if a drug comes in under a different uh, compete, you know, under uh, under loss of patent, the drug has to look different. It has to contain the active ingredient that is therapeutic, but fillers can be different. Mm -hmm. And that's so that people can recognize that it's not this, you know, it's not made by the same manufacturer. So and that's, they could that's have a, a reaction truth. to that filler. Pardon me? They, they might be, they might have a reaction to the filler. Is that what might Right. You know, where some people, well, n the next question is what we call bioavailability. So for a drug to become approved for non-patented dispensing or manufacture, the drug has to have a bioavailability, meaning that it gets into the body in, the, in a manner that's within 95% of the name brand. So the name brand is the standard benchmark. Now what can change there is how fast it comes into the body, how high in concentration it goes, and how fast it's eliminated. That's called the area under the curve. So it's based on how much drug gets into the body over time, and it's a 24-hour period that's studied. If, if you can show to the FDA that our drug gets in the body and stays in the body and the area under the curve is within 95% of that product, then this is allowed to be dispensed as a generic equivalent. So the truth is, as a physician, I will tell you that in general, generic medications work just as well as name brands. There are situations where we, we are talking extremely small doses where this might be an issue. And then there are times when peak uh, drug levels can cause side effects that weren't seen with the name brand. So those are the scenarios where uh, there can be a difference. Um, yeah, once I, the drug's available generic, I generally try to buy it because it generally works just fine. Yeah, I have uh, MS, and I've been given a, a, dis, uh, a prescription for... Um, two drugs, one's a generic, one isn't, and I've heard people talk about it, saying that the generic isn't as good. Um, um, a Lyrica, I forget, it's gamapentin, I forget the uh, generic. Oh, yeah, that's uh, gamapentin. Yes, um, yes. Neurontin was the name Yes, brand. so there was Neurontin, Lyrica, gamapentin, and you hear all, so all sorts of people saying all sorts of things, so that's kind of nice to maybe put the kibosh on that. Uh, I think the well, placebo is effect is happening here. If you think right. you're taking a, ge a generic, you may not react properly. Right. we got to take a break. Again, this is going very quickly, and we'd like to bring uh, Catherine into the conversation. We're going to uh, talk okay. about opioids. I don't know if you have any experience with patients in that, Doc. Hang with us. Feel free to pitch in what you know. Uh, conversation's been great so far. Thank you. We'll be right back. I'm Donald L. Dowers Jr., your motivational guru. This is the DLD Motivational Moment. You got up this morning. 
You got up this morning. Eyes sneaking open as the feet hit the floor. Got to thank God for the rise this day. The stove perking the smell of nutrition. Get to your destination with planned unselfish acts. Bulletin board read, do you have any to spare? Happiness and understanding. We all have experienced that one phone call. Family member, co-worker, friend has passed on. We don't know our last evening or morning. Get up. Help someone out. Now walk it out. You got up this morning. This has been the DLD Motivational Moment. You can reach out to DLD at DLD28002 at yahoo.com or 813-394-5875. Hey, this is A.J. Wright, better known as Mr. Clean. You looking for some great barbecues? Come see them two brothers in the grill. Located at 423 Virginia Street, Charleston, West Virginia. We got ribs, chicken, pulled pork, brisket, collard greens, mac and cheese, baby. Come get some. And get you a nice, smooth cigar. 304-550-4431. That is 304-550-4431. Come get some, baby. The rib man, mama, the rib man. medical ethicists as well because I, I i i think what shames me the most or hurts me the most or upsets me the most about what's going on with big pharma is the complete and utter total lack of regard for human life as we've seen in the opioid crisis can you tell me something about that we were talking about uh, the small town in texas that has three thousand people that receive three hundred thousand tablets of opi- opioid drugs the uh, company that designed and built it. You know about that one. Yeah. So it started from, the, you want to start with the beginning for the family who, um, who said that, hey, that stuff's not even addictive. So this is something I think that we, we have to point out, um, that this has been a recurrent pattern in history of um, uh, when there's one drug that becomes a problem, um, there's another drug that's introduced um, to, to say, well, this is now safe. This is a miracle. Um, So years ago, um, heroin was introduced um, as as the substitute for morphine um, by by Bayer at the time. Um, So this this is nothing new to see. um, What could be wrong with heroin? (sighs) Right, right. This is this is nothing new to see that there's um, uh, unanticipated Uh. side effects of a particular drug that enters the market. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, we've heard about the opioid crisis. We know that it's a problem. Um, But I think that something um, that that has been absent is understanding, first of all, um, the extent that um, uh, pharmaceutical companies um, in a number of different um, cases have had in um, uh, influencing physician prescribing um, and in... um, and in making physicians think, um, at you know, a decade ago, that um, that their patients needed this, and so it was actually part of um, uh, hospital accreditation standards to ask about pain to make sure that patients weren't in pain. Um, so it's uh, it was a multi-system. Um, effort to really increase the the prescription of of these medications. And Big Pharma spends almost all of its money on advertising, and we see it every minute of the day. I don't care what it is. The ads are horrible. You have a a skin rash. You take the pills, may cause blindness, may cause urinary tract infection, may cause colon cancer. I mean, you bring up a very good ridiculous, um, but it's true. They Uh, spend 50% of their money money on advertising. The reason why drugs cost so much money is advertising. And I'm sure, Doc, you might want to chime in on this. Do you actually get patients that come to you and say they want to try a specific drug that they saw on TV or a TV ad? Is that happening? And we're all, uh, one of the only countries happen, that does that. But since I yeah. no longer uh, you know, uh, am under the control of these decisions by the, mar- you know, by mm-hmm. the, the paid market, um, that doesn't happen as much. But, yes, that used to happen. Um, I will say this about advertising. It's turning out that... Um, again, policies have effects. I would argue that, uh, not argue, I would suggest that 
your doctors are the ones that are actually seeing those ads. I, I wrote a, I, I do write a blog. I forgot to tell you guys about that. It's called the doctorsreport.net. But um, uh, I wrote about how um, the, the, the physicians, the, the market, the advertising is going to the doctor, uh, whether mm-hmm. it, it is subliminal. But, you know, physicians can't access, uh, the, the, the drug companies are having a hard time getting their reps in front of doctors now. So um, advertising on TV is one way that they get to it. Yeah, I but see a hundred yeah, of them a day, some, hundreds and hundreds yeah, of ads putting some a day. Pressure, putting some pressure on the patient to come in and speak to the doctor about it does happen. Yeah. And, you know, when there's a new drug and it's really, you know, a positive thing, in other words, if it's not the 17th drug in the arena, <laughs> you know, that kind of advertising is very helpful. Yeah. But, you know, if it's just another Me Too, you know, stomach medication, I agree yeah. it's kind of wasted uh it's a waste of everybody's time and money. Thank you for chiming in. So I didn't mean to jump in, but the conversation is very fluid. There's so much to this conversation. We could be here all week. Let's get back to the opioid crisis. And it was created. This was man-made. It was self-made. It didn't exist. Um, was that the difference between OxyContin and OxyCodone? Were those the two drugs that were battling it yeah. out? So, um, and what, what we saw with this... As, um, you know, as we've been talking about, is that physicians believe that they're actually helping their patients in, yeah. in almost all cases. Um, so, so it takes a while um, for, you know, for us to see, well, it's, it's not helping patients. Um, right. They're becoming uh, dependent and uh, addicted on, um, on these medications. Um, and what's happening now um, is, is we're seeing the problem of trying to get patients off of these medications. Right. They can't go cold, tur- cold turkey. They can't right. go cold turkey. And yeah. so they go to heroin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what people are doing. Some, some are going to heroin. Yeah. And then um, uh, part of what, what I've looked at in my research is um, looking at this push to put all of the patients that had a dependence on opioids into medication-assisted treatment. So traditionally, when we're, when we're looking at um, people who have um, addiction, and we're talking about people um, who, who have um, a potentially a heroin addiction, who have um, a long-standing addiction, they're very different patient populations from people who might have had um, a, you know, a knee surgery. Or tooth and, pulled, like right. the um, wisdom teeth pulled. And so yeah. it's, it's two very different patient populations. And so part of what I've looked at in my research is, well, where does this idea come from that everybody should be transitioned long-term um, to, to another opioid? Um, and so it, for people who are interested, they can look at some of my research on that. Where can we find your research? Um, it, if you go to the USF website, okay. um, you'll find a link uh, to my personal web page. You'll also find a link to my Facebook page and, and all of the, the research that I've done on this topic. Yeah. Go ahead and tell people how they can yes. find you. What's your, web, yes. what's your website? And spell your name because yeah, we can so, barely say it. <laughs> sure. So if you go to Catherine Drabiak, D R A B I A K J D dot com, um, or even just Google, Google my name and, okay. and all of this will pop up. Um, but I think this is important for people to understand um, the, the way that um, uh, pharmaceutical companies um, have influenced this uh, perception that patients should be on medication long term. Now, doctor, how do you feel about that? Because we know there are patients who are in pain lifelong. Sure. Well, this is one of those stories where my short answer is I wish people would let physicians take care of their patients. Um, we, it's never been a mystery that narcotics are addictive to your doctors. We've always known that. Um, and we've understood that, even as sold. Um, it is true. Here's where I think things might have gone wrong a little bit in terms of the industry and how we were taught to- how we use these products. A lot of times, it's acute pain comes from a surgical situation. So often, surgeons are the ones that initiate some of these medications. What they don't do is follow their patients like I do. I'm a primary care doctor. I know without a doubt that opioids are addictive, and I know that some some of us are more akin to being addicted than others. Pre-existing. Yeah, I've addictive. always resisted. I've always resisted using narcotics in persons who don't have a terminal illness because I knew that it would result in an addiction that would become a dependency on the system, and that's not healthy. I believe in health. 
not sickness. I know because and, morphine uh, was I, only used if you know the person was going to be terminal. Correct. So what difference does it right. make, right? Well, yeah. Well, there's you know, there's a, you know again, people are going to abuse uh, people are going to abuse substances um, no matter how we try to regulate that. Uh, that's why we have black markets. I mean, that's just yeah. definitely true. That's going to happen. But, but the point to how this all got done, I remember because I trained and came out in '93. In '93 was when we created uh, very soon after that. I used to walk in the hospitals, and I rounded every day in the hospital. That's one of the things I do. And uh, I would see this Bill of Rights, and right up front to this Bill of Rights for patient care was, I will not, I will have my pain addressed. Mm -hmm. That was literally mm -hmm. a policy by the JACO organization, yes. by the, wow. the, the oversight of hospitals. So this goes so deep, and it's, it's not just pharma, although they're helping the problem, but they're the ones who developed the product. We've had morphine forever. Um, morphine works just as well as oxycontin for pain, but it's just as addictive. And, and, um, and I'm, I'm going to jump. Rate, I'm going to. We're back to the story. Let the doctors <laughs> take care of their patients, yes. and, and everybody else just kind of get out of the way. Good point. I'm going to ask the million dollar question. Okay, because I've heard this endlessly, and I know you have been part of the industry. Studies. We do study after study after study, and it's costing billions of dollars. And that's why all pharmaceuticals are so expensive. We research and we research, RD. and research now that and right, and look what we ended up with: the opioid crisis. They didn't research anything. They knew that was addictive. Oxycodone. They knew uh, morphine. Ninety probably. I don't know what percentage of pain medications are addictive, and it just sounds like it's awfully high. How could they have missed that? And then turn around and say, you have to pay you know, $90 per pill because we had to do all this research, which ends up making you an addict anyway. So it sounds like a lot of falsehoods. Well, well the research they had to offer was that their drug took care of pain, and it certainly did. So that's they all you get. It doesn't make you an addict, also, right? No, no, no. Wait a second. Now I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna t to differentiate on that. Um, the idea of what are the potential side effects? I suspect that addiction was listed in that list of potential side effects. Was it? This is a question we, of. We're gonna, of we're gonna ask Catherine about that. Choices. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. That's a great point. Thank yeah. you for tapping me down. Go ahead. Yeah, so what, what we see actually is that there there is a difference between. Um, uh, most people who are not going to look at the FDA package labeling um, and then what uh, studies um, that are in medical journals and targeted to physicians say, there's a very distinct difference. So um, both for um, what, what was represented at the time uh, for opioids, but then now also for o opioid replacement drugs. So I'm talking about things like methadone or buprenorphine. Um, if there are people listening who have spoken to their doctor, and their doctors told them, um, you know, go on medication-assisted treatment. These are the types of drugs that, that I'm talking about. So if you look at the FDA package labeling, it will say um, that, that the patient, it'll list out all the different side effects of um, euphoria, nausea, yeah. There, um, you always get something about two feet wide um, with all right. the side so, effects. So there's a lot of side effects, yeah. and, and basically what it says is, yes, you can become dependent on this. Yes, it can impair you um, to, the, to the point of intoxication and death. Um, but if you read the medical journals and all of these other um, uh, policy statements that are put out um, by, uh, by, you know, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, um, it is telling not only physicians, but it tells patients, this medication will help you. You won't experience euphoria. You won't be impaired. Um, this is going to help you get over your dependence to opioids. So it's really mixed messages. And so that's something that, that I've looked at in my research. And I think that people should know um, is that they're not getting the accurate picture necessarily. Now, there doctor, are risks how, involved. How do you feel about um, taking, Thank you. Um, helping someone beat an addiction by taking another medication like Methadone. Um, well, so now we're into some practicality. I'll try to be brief. Okay. Uh, methadone exists primarily as uh, for walk-in clinics because it has a very long half-life. So one of the reasons we withdraw from medications uh, in the case of opioids has to do with the removal of the drug that's been blocking these pain receptors. So when the drug leaves the body, the pain receptors are now hypersensitive, mm -hmm. and that's why people experience untoward side effects of withdrawal. 
But so when you give methadone, you're able to create a clinic where you can give people the drug once a week and keep them from going through severe withdrawal. Yes, you do create a dependency, but then as a society, we got to ask this question. Do we want everybody in the street going through active withdrawal, vomiting, you know, having sweats, feeling terrible, sometimes throwing themselves off a bridge because they can't take no, it? Suicide, Or do sure. we want to give them so, a little gentler uh, way out? What I will tell you is I personally try to take these drugs away completely, um, but it's a very difficult process. And unless the patient's totally 100% motivated to do it, what happens is they will end up either leaving my care or they will um, seek one of these other alternatives. And you, your point about the overdose, the deaths, heroin is what's, heroin and fentanyl is what's killing people overwhelmingly. Yep. The narcotics that they're on by prescription are some cases causing death, but most of the abuse is coming from the street. But they're going to the street with the new policies that have been created that are telling the doctors you can only write for 72 hours of pills. You know, everybody misinterprets the law. The pharmacies are denying prescriptions because it didn't follow the rule of the law in terms of the three-day sequence and so on wow. and so forth. Well, so you what you're doing is creating, you're creating a massive... Yeah, you're creating a massive queue at the pharmacy, and and the doctor's office is being interrupted for all this. And you're 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 you know again, it's well intentioned, but no one ever asks the physicians. Well, you know, we're asking we you, Doc, and I'm going to ask you to give me a minute to go to a commercial break, and we're going to come back. Fantastic information, stuff I didn't know. It's hard. Yeah, and our medical ethicists and our attorney. We'll be right back. Samson. I didn't come from a very rich family, and so paying for college would have been very tough. I don't know if I would have been able to go to the college that I went to, and then I don't know if I would have gotten into the career that I am in. So I think Bright Futures has done a lot to shape my life. I uh, got a job as a structural engineer, and I design residential buildings, commercial buildings all over the United States. Because of Bright Futures, I was able to go to college. You know, so many kids just don't even ever get that opportunity. And to be able to do it and not have any debt when I graduated is amazing. And it was all thanks to Bright Futures. Florida has created more than one million jobs in only five years, and a great education connects our students to these exciting opportunities. That's why the Florida Lottery has funded Bright Futures Scholarships to help over 725,000 students attend college. Because every play is for education. The Florida Lottery. Just imagine. This is Linda Archie with Taya Temple United Methodist Church. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month at the Village Market East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. Free parking, free admission, fresh produce, live entertainment, vendor shopping, and delicious cooked food. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month, beginning June 22nd. For vendor information, call me. 1-888-991-2502. See our ad in In Touch News or Florida Sentinel. Please call me at 1-888-991-2502. The Village Market at East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. issues in the United States. So we're really excited about this show. Hope you tell friends to listen. And remember, we're always here for Tampa Bay Politics every Wednesday at 11. And we try to keep our politics local. That's our main focus. But I, I will state one thing from the national level and another reason some of this is happening that we all know, if you're political, you know, the lobbying power of Big Pharma is huge. 281 281 million dollars and some of our politicians are paid off yeah they are democrat and i found a couple of them and i found some republicans i mean it's just you know we have to pay to run you have to pay to play that being said let's get back to what you were discussing about the fact that 
The pharmaceuticals are getting you hooked on the meds. Now they're coming up with ways to get you off the meds. So they're perpetually in your medical loop. So this this is part of what I've looked at in my research. And, and again, this is why... Um, um, you know, we can use the law to understand um, what is it that um, that the players involved are doing? What did they know? What was their plan? Um, we do pharma. Per, yes. So um, uh, it, there was a lawsuit, um, multiple lawsuits against Purdue Pharma. Um, and, and what I had looked at in my research um, was allegations um, that Purdue Pharma so not only created um, some of the, the initial medications um, that that started the opioid crisis, um, but that um, had a patent on a formulation of buprenorphine um, that is given as a replacement opioid. So they um, caused the problem. Now they are. Now they got you hooked on the second level of medications to get you off. So what, this sounds evil to me. This sounds unethical. It makes me sick. People are dying. Enough's enough. We got to go factor. after Big Pharma. We so have to go factor. exactly after Big Pharma. Is this ethical? So, so what Big Pharma would say is that they're creating a number of medications um, that that are useful to people, right? So, if we're talking about opioids, there is a, a reason for using opioids, and there is a reason for using other types of drugs. Um, but I think what we should be looking at is instances in which um, Big Pharma looks to expand its market share, number one, by um, promoting the use of its drug for people that weren't otherwise um, included in a particular category. Um, so as, as we heard from our doctor, this so happened. Do mean someone who had a toothache, someone who had a surgery, all of a sudden, bam, they're hooked on opioids. Yeah, that didn't it happens. Happen. Um, 15, and, 15, starting to jump in, 15-year-old girl from Plant High School. She had um, surgery for um, root canals or something. Oh, no, had her wisdom teeth pulled. Hooked on opioids. They cut back her meds. Now, now she doctor, started shooting heroin. She's dead that, now. She's 17, oh 17 and doctor, she died. Are you finding that the average person who's abusing opioids is just an addict or someone who just had an unfortunate surgery or something? You're asking me? I yes, can't answer doctor. that question. I don't know the statistics of who becomes addicted. I know that it is currently right now certainly popular to, uh, to blame the industry. But remember, it's doctors and patients that are engaging in this activity when we talk about big pharma. Yeah, yes, there's responsibility there. The there drugs, should be. And they, they produce the drug. They offered it. They sold it to us. But we're the ones that are using it. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to innovation, I, I would like to point out that I can tell you from personal experience here in our own community that one of the things is, you know, your doctors are trying to solve this problem, okay? And one of the ways is uh, we're making advances in same-day surgery procedures. We're getting hips done and out of the, ho out of the office before going to the hospital that, that used to never be done. Are you doing one of the reasons hip replacement as outpatient surgery? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, what I'm saying is we're, we're creating ways to block pain locally with uh, uh, absorbable pain uh, anesthetics uh -huh. so that we don't have to give people narcotics at all. And the other thing that's happening, and I see this a lot in our orthopedic arena, we've learned that intravenous IV Tylenol, acetaminophen, works extremely well and yeah. comparable to narcotics for post-op pain. So w w the problem is we can't give IV instead of medicine. The drug levels in the brain are so much higher, and it's not addictive. But you can't deliver that as an outpatient very, uh, very uh, feasibly. Efficiently, yeah. But, but, but these are things that we're doing. Um, and I must say this. You don't get hooked on opioids in one pill That's or correct. in three days. You know, it takes time. Some of the addiction is psychological. Some yeah, that's what is, I was saying. I don't, I don't want pain. I don't want pain, so I'll take anything. You know, I'll, I'll smoke uh, manure if it makes me feel better. <laughs> you know, um, so so that's you know. So this is a complex topic. It is. But thank you for sharing it with solve, us. Yeah, we would solve ninety percent of illness if we could have, if we could deal with addiction. You addiction want, to food, and, addiction yeah. to sex, addiction yeah, yeah. to drugs, cigarettes, yeah, yeah booze. Yeah. 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 And you know, I work in a gym, and yeah. here's an interesting study that I read about. Uh, People with chronic back pain, uh, everybody comes to me with back pain. Mm -hmm. uh, we do stretching. I show them PNF stretching. I show them a holistic alternative methods. First of all, they're in complete shock. 
they do get better. And they did a huge research study. I used to, to do medical news reporting at Channel 28 News um, that getting out of the bed and being physical and working out actually alleviates back pain faster, more efficiently, and better for you than taking pills just to alleviate your pain. There's two things, alleviating, alleviating the pain, and the second part is fixing the problem. And people are Correct. terrified of getting out of bed. Oh, I have pain, I have pain. They're terrified of going to the gym. They're terrified to take in an alternative route besides just stopping mm -hmm. the pain. The pain's a symptom of a major illness, of a major injury. Taking a pain so pill that just starts it, you're still injured. Marijuana? You're still injured. This is something I think that, that we're hesitant to even talk about in, in our society. And this is me just speaking as a person. Yes, thank you. Um, not, not as a professor, but that we have a responsibility to take care of ourselves. Absolutely. Right. Um, so, right. You know, we, Amen. Right. To, to, to eat better, um, to eat healthier, uh, to, to get better sleep, to move around, to exercise. Um, and, uh, you know, to not be glued to our smartphones all day long, getting text neck. Yeah. Um, so this is something I, I think, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to say that um, the responsibility isn't always on on a company or isn't or the always on the, on yeah. the doctor. Sure. But we hold a stake in it. Um, and th there's actually a, um, I don't know if we've got time for a, sure, a, we're still chatting. a, a funny case. So when I teach this to students, um, I, I teach this case where there was, um, there was a woman who was, um, diabetic. Um, she was a heavy smoker. She loved her donuts and, uh, she went in for, um, surgery on her toe and, um, uh, the doctor told her, you need to stop smoking. Uh, you need to control your sugar, you know, stop with the donut habit, lose a little bit of weight before surgery, because this is going to affect your surgical outcome. Mm -hmm. So the surgery didn't go well. Um, she sued the doctor because she lost part of her toe. And it was because she lied to the doctor. She didn't stop smoking. Um, and it was it was a poor surgical outcome. Mm -hmm. So it's a funny a funny case in the sense of um, you know we, we think of well it's somebody else's fault. So it raises the question of well how much fault is it right that that we have a stake in in taking care of ourselves. Well, I have tons and tons and tons of sex 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 stories. Excuse me, I forgot how to talk at the gym. I've got somebody who's 60, 70 pounds overweight is going to get a total knee replacement. Let me tell you the abject pain of the constant poundings. You don't go to the doctor, no offense to you, doc, but I rarely hear a doctor do anything holistic like, you know what, I'm not going to give you pills to lose weight. I'm going to give you a prescription for the gym, and I'm being facetious, but to a certain point, we need to look at the gym. We need to look at the physical. We need to look at the holistic, the psychological. I think it's the what's putting the whole um, addiction system into well, play. I'd like to hear the doctor's take on sure. this because um, there's people who are not going to give up anything. And the doctor <laughs> well, that's gonna, true. And the doctor is going to so, see them. Yeah, you're correct. Yeah. You're correct. Well, my, my practice name is uh, uh, includes the term uh, wellness. Wellness. I'm so a wellness actually, coach. I am holistic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm holistic in my approach. And yes, behavior and lifestyle is always the first thing we discuss. I rarely, I, I do use medications for acute pain. Rarely sure. do I use narcotics for that purpose, actually. So the point about using these drugs is what's wrong with you? If you've got terminal pancreatic cancer and it's eating a hole in your spine, yeah. I'm going to give you all the morphine you need. Sure, okay? and nobody would blame you for that. morphine's man's best sure. friend in that scenario. Absolutely. But if you've got you know, mechanical back pain, we're not going to get on narcotics. We're not going to do it. That's how I see it. And then what we do, I use a lot of physical therapy. Okay. I use the extent yep. that ancillary service all of the time. And it is the best route for most people. So mm. to answer that question, again, you you, you got to look towards uh, giving your doctors time, you know, to take mm. care of their patients. And that's where we, that's a whole other show. We're on your team, and it may be system. another show we're going to do. But yeah. we have two okay. minutes left. I, I love everything you talked about. I, I think we could do another show. I think it's in the making. Kat, um, Catherine wanted to say something. Yeah, ju just to speak to the doctor's point, it, it is about time. And I think it comes full circle that physicians need to be reimbursed 
for having these preventive care discussions and for having um, uh, reimbursement for other uh, providers um, in their practice uh, to talk about diet, lifestyle, exercise, so that so that we can be healthier um, a, as a country. And less yes. addicted. Yes. And less <laughs> addicted. Doctor, we don't want you to get away without telling us how to get hold of you. Hello? Pardon me? Can you tell I'm us here. how we get hold of you? How we can get a hold of you. Can you oh, give us how your do we beats? get a hold of me? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. easy. I'm, 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 my, my name and practice is on the Internet. My uh, office is here in Fort Myers, Florida. I am totally transparent, so I think, oh. the, uh, uh, I think you guys would love to see how I'm trying to just uh, walk the path. Yeah. I think that's what has to happen. Can you give us your blog information, please? I know oh, folks blog love the blogs. The do- www.thedoctorsreport.net. Do it again. Say right it on. again. Say it again. www.thedoctorsreport.net. There is no apostrophe in the doctors, but the doctorsreport.net. Not don't go to .com because that's a whole different. Okay, thing. Okay, and it sounds like we'll probably and, be uh, bringing you back with your wealth of information. You, know you were a great um, guest. I wouldn't be surprised well, if if there weren't some physicians who heard this show yeah. and might think about doing what you're doing. Yeah, I with, think that's with, a great idea. Prescription drugs. And I'd love to bring you back. I don't think we Thank really talked about me. the ethical portion of it, but <laughs> it came through in in the ways it had to. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I it, think this was great. Thank you guys. All right, we'll let you go, Doc. Catherine. Have a good day. And Catherine. All right. Bye. Catherine. Yeah, I think it was wow. He was great. All you right. were great. We're out.